It has been argued that one's constitutional rights are the most protected during the trial phase of the justice process. Indeed, in the United States, we have an adversarial process which is unlike any other system of justice in the world. Here, the accused has an attorney who is either court appointed or retained, and the trial is presided over by a neutral judge. Of course, it is worth mentioning that the vast majority of all cases, perhaps as many as 90%, are disposed of through the plea bargain process. Of the remaining cases, the vast majority of these will be decided upon by a bench trial. In reality, only about 1% of all criminal cases are decided before an actual jury, even though the Constitution explicitly mentions that citizens are entitled to a trial by a jury. Interestingly, a jury of 12 is not required by the Sixth Amendment, and in fact, according to Ballou v. Georgia, a jury can consist of anywhere between 6 and 12 people. However, this does not include capital cases. In capital cases, tradition has always held that there is a jury of 12. The reasoning behind this is that a larger size jury will increase the probability that a jury in a capital case actually reflects the characteristics of the community. Contrary to popular belief, a jury verdict does not always need to be unanimous. And in fact, in the landmark case Johnson v. Louisiana, the court upheld a 9-3 to vote for a conviction. Nevertheless, 45 states within the United States require unanimous decisions in criminal cases. In the rare situations where a defendant has a trial before a jury, both sides will engage in the voir dire process, which essentially refers to the systematic selection of jurors. In theory, this process is intended to produce an impartial, unbiased jury. However, in, re in reality, both sides use peremptory challenges in order to produce a partial and biased jury, one in their favor. This week, I would like for you to read the article titled, The Potentially Biasing Effects of Voir Dire in Juvenile Waiver Cases. Essentially, the article poses the question as to whether or not jurors who support waiving a juvenile to an adult court are more likely to convict defendants than jurors who are unwilling to waive a juvenile to an adult court. This makes for some very interesting reading and provides a new take on the jury selection process. It is important to point out that attorneys for either the defense or prosecution cannot eliminate a prospective juror solely because of race. And interestingly enough, a white defendant may object to the exclusion of jurors who are members of racial minority groups and vice versa. Additionally, the court has ruled that it is unconstitutional for an attorney to systematically strike prospective jurors solely due to gender. Nevertheless, in spite of the fact that the court has made efforts to prevent attorneys from excluding jurors because of either their race or gender, I would submit to you that this happens all the time during the voir dire process. It is simply very difficult to ascertain the motives that an attorney may have. Having said this, if a prosecutor struck every potential minority member of a jury, there is a high likelihood that the defense attorney would object to this. And if an all-white jury was selected, this could form the basis for an appeal. So both sides do need to be careful during the voir dire process. Of course, we now know from the 1963 case Gideon v. Wainwright that defendants have the right to be represented at every critical stage of a criminal proceeding. Prior to this unanimous Supreme Court ruling, court-appointed lawyers were only provided to defendants who were charged with capital offenses. So not surprisingly, Gideon was found guilty as he had to conduct his own defense. From his prison cell at Florida State Prison, making use of only the prison, library, and writing in pencil on prison stationery, 
Gideon appealed to the Supreme Court in a suit against the Secretary of the Florida Department of Corrections. Gideon argued that he had been denied counsel and therefore his Sixth Amendment rights as applied to the states by the 14th Amendment had been violated. About 2,000 individuals convicted in Florida alone were freed as a result of the Gideon decision. Gideon himself was not freed. Instead, he got a new trial. Eventually, his court-appointed attorney was able to obtain an acquittal for Mr. Gideon in a new trial. It took only an hour for the jury to find Gideon not guilty. Okay, let us now turn to what is known as the Brady Rule. In criminal trials, the prosecutor has a duty to disclose evidence that is favorable to the defendant. One fairly recent case involving Brady violations occurred in 2006 in the Duke Lacrosse rape case. In this case, a North Carolina district attorney withheld evidence from the defense concerning DNA tests performed. Essentially, the prosecutor did not hand over DNA tests which would have been favorable to the defendants who were on the Duke lacrosse team. Do you remember this case? The defendants were privileged white males who had allegedly raped an African-American exotic dancer. Since this case, many critics have argued that the prosecutor brought the Duke case forward simply to win a tough re-election in a city with a sizable African-American community. If you are not familiar with this case, I would encourage you to Google it. It illustrates the importance of the Brady Rule and shows that prosecutors can be disciplined or disbarred if they deliberately withhold exculpatory evidence. By the way, the U.S. Supreme Court very recently, in January of 2012, looked at Brady violations in the case of Smith v. Kane. The U.S. Supreme Court has overturned a major conviction obtained by New Orleans prosecutors because the defense did not receive important exculpatory evidence before the trial. The court ruled 8-1 to one on behalf of Juan Smith, convicted of five murders on the strength of testimony by a single witness who identified him as the first gunman to come through the door during a robbery. The witness had earlier told the detective that he could not identify the perpetrators, but notes recounting the conversation were not disclosed to the defense attorney or during the trial. Obviously, this is a huge piece of exculpatory evidence that was ignored by prosecutors. Throughout the years, numerous studies have examined the race of the defendant during a criminal trial. Most studies have confirmed that defendants who are members of racial minorities tend to be given longer sentences than white defendants. However, what happens in plea bargaining situations where the defense attorney is supposed to cut the best deal for his or her client? Well, according to a very recent article titled Defense Attorney Plea Recommendations and Client Recommendations, there is a strong possibility that defense attorneys perceive that they may be able to get a better deal for white clients. As you read through this article, ask yourself whether or not you agree with the findings of this study. Was the research solid? Do you think the study is truly generalizable to what actually happens in the real world? Is the criminal justice system inherently racist? Consider these questions as you read through the article. The last issue that we should consider relates to pretrial publicity. The court has held that judges have the discretion to change the place where a trial is held if there may be undue pretrial publicity, which could influence potential jurors. This is permissible in both felony and misdemeanor cases. And let us not forget that judges have the authority to sequester juries in order to limit contact with the outside world. In high-profile cases, especially those involving celebrities, judges may order that all of the jury members reside in a nearby hotel. This will ensure that the jury avoids potentially damaging information which may be found in the multimedia. Also, it is not uncommon for judges to impose a gag rule which prohibits individuals in the trial from releasing information to the media. 
Of course, it should be noted that a gag order can only last for the duration of the trial. Once the trial has concluded, the parties involved are free to say whatever they want. After all, they do enjoy the freedom of speech. And by that same token, members of the jury are free to talk with the media after the trial. They're free to go on talk shows and perhaps write a book explaining the decision making the process of the jury known to the public. Again, this must be after the trial. In today's world of the internet, talk shows, 24-hour news coverage, and tabloid journalism, it has been fairly difficult for the judges to control the press. This may be due in part to the fact that the First Amendment guarantee of the freedom of press is very powerful. Generally speaking, it is fairly difficult for a trial judge to justify most attempts to limit the types of items that media can report in connection with a criminal case. Interestingly, however, some states give judges the sole authority as to whether or not a case can be televised. Clearly, there are many issues to consider during a criminal trial. The accused enjoys basic constitutional rights and defendants are entitled to have an attorney present during all phases of the criminal justice process. This begins with lineups, assuming that formal charges have been filed and extends to custodial interrogations as well as preliminary examinations, followed by the arraignment and then the trial, which has been discussed during this presentation. Finally, if indeed a defendant is convicted either by a judge or jury, he or she is entitled to an attorney at the sentencing process as well as the appeal process. In conclusion, the right to counsel is a fundamental right and is crucial to providing defendants with justice during all of the major phases of this process.